to welcome everybody to the second part of our webinar series titled Snakebite Envenoming the Global Research Landscape. Uh, my name is Ashna. I am a PhD student at the Global Health Network, and I will be chairing this webinar today. Um, those who were here last week with us know the drill. Um, those who are new, I'll just take a moment to explain some housekeeping rules. Um, first, this webinar is being simultaneously translated into French and Spanish. Um, if you would like to switch languages, please use the tool toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Find the little globe looking icon, click on it, and you can select the language of your choice. Um, I'll give folks a minute to do so. You should now be hearing the language that you have selected um, with many thanks to our live interpreters. I will provide some housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Global Health Network's website in a few weeks. Because we have so many participants today, we encourage using the chat function to introduce yourself and the Q&A function to ask questions. So again, that is the chat function to introduce yourself and the Q&A function to ask questions related to the presentations. Which brings us to our agenda. Next slide, please. Thank you. To note, um, this webinar follows a survey that was sent out through the Global Health Network some months ago. Um, we were using that survey to try and understand who was working on snake bites and where, and there was an overwhelmingly positive response. So we asked respondents if they'd like to come together to provide a brief overview of their work. Um, and you'll see a list of some of these snake and snake bite experts on the slide here. Um, we saw merit in connecting these individuals around the world working on this topic, and we thought we'd open it up to you, the audience, so you can see what's happening too. And you showed a great level of interest in snake bites. Next slide, please. So here's a map that shows how many people registered for this, registered for this webinar series and where they are coming from. It also shows why people are here. So it's clear we have a lot of clinicians who treat snake bites and we have a lot of snake bite, general snake bite enthusiasts among us today. So we'll jump right in and get started. Next slide, please. So first we'll hear from our colleague Nuhu Mohammed, who is a lab scientist and the head of diagnostic services at the Snake Bite Treatment and Research Hospital in Keltungo, Nigeria. Nuhu will be providing an overview of this hospital and the research that goes on there. So I'll go ahead and hand it to you, Nuhu. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ashna and the panel. Like I've just been introduced, my name is Nuhu Mohammed. I'm a medical laboratory scientist working in one of the largest snake bite hospitals in the world in Gombe, northeastern Nigeria, sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. I'll be giving the overview of the activities we do in our center. Next slide. These are my outlines. Next slide. Yeah, snake bites is described as one of the injury caused by a bite from a snake. And um, basically it appears sometimes after the bite, you see some two punctured wounds. And uh, the snake bite also can be called venomous or non-venomous. And sometimes we call them dry bites or wet bite. When we say wet bite, we mean the, the bite is being accompanied by the injection of the venom into the victim system. And then the one that is dried is the one that does not contain any venom. Um, snake bite is also a life-threatening condition that is caused by the poison from the snake. It mainly affects people that are from low economic class, like farmers, herders, and um, some people that are also from a low income uh, society. Next slide. It is globally estimated that about 4.5 to 5.4 million people are affected by this uh, snake bite annually, out of which 1.8 to 2.7 million develop clinical illness, and about 81,000 to 138,000 die from these complications. In accounts, we 12,290 also die as a result of this bite, and about 14,760 suffer from uh, complications like amputations. 55,332 mental illness uh, has also been recorded as a result of this snake bite. The following species are the most common species involved in venom in this part of the country. We have the source scale carpet viper, 
which contributes about 90 to 95% of our cases. We also have the black naked fighting uh, cobra. We have Bovada, we have Mamba. Next slide. Snake bite treatment and research hospital, like I mentioned, is located in northeastern Nigeria from a local government called Kaltungo in Gombe State. And this hospital was has been in operation for over 70 years. Formerly, it was called the missionary uh, hospital because it was the then missionaries that established this hospital. However, it was later commissioned into a full-fledged 150 bed capacity hospital in, 19, in, in, in 2019. Over the years, this hospital has been a center that has been attending to snake bite patients of about more than 200, 2,005, 2,500 cases in a year. And sometimes it ranges even up to 3,000 patients that we see, depending on the availability of the snake anti-snake venom that we have at hand. The hospital pride itself as the largest snake bite hospital in terms of patients uh, load. Next slide. Over the one of the cardinal aims of this hospital is not only treating patients, but it is also uh, involved in research cases. And this hospital has embarked on more than two, uh, more than 20 research, and some of them have been published in peer uh, review journals. The hospital also is undergoing currently a research work. Um, this has uh, some of the research work we are on, uh, embarking on in our center because we have three cardinal aims of establishing this um, center. In addition to treatment, we are also undergoing research work. And these are some of the research work that we are currently doing. Uh, one of them is Improving care for snake environment administrating antiviral health workers and reposing units on fund. This is being funded by PTM, Sector X2. Um, is also being funded by Royal Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. The thought is just partial and epidemiological analysis of snake bite envenomation in Gombe State. The fourth is assessment of antimicrobial resistance from the wound swab of a patient with snake bite and also from orophagial swab from the snakes. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, sorry, sorry. Please, can you go back a bit? Yes. This one is um the the summary of what we have done in the last five years. You can see in January. In the year uh, twenty nineteen. We've admitted about 3,150 patients. And then out of these patients, 25% of them, 23% of them are female. And then and 28.3% were pediatrics. And then 48.7% of them uh, males. In the year 2020, total number of 2,605 patients were males constituted for 48.5%, female constituted 8%, and then pediatrics. And 
thing. Hey, Nugu, I think you might be. The audio might be a little bit distorted. On 2022, we admitted 2,790. And then the percentage is, as we can see, as projected. Please, next slide. By the total number of patients we admitted in these five years, we admitted about 13,000 patients in that year. You could also see from the pie chart here that um, apart from the male, the children are also part of the people that constituted the large number of the victims. This is because for males, they are the ones that are always going to the farm. And you know, most of these people that are being beaten are being beaten from the farms because this is the occupation that they always uh, embark upon. And some of them are also farmers, some are headmen. And by the time they go to the farms, they go together with these children. They accompany them into the farm. But the women, most of them also do go to the farm, but it's not all the time that they go to the farm, as we can see in the next slide. Next slide. This is just a summary of the number of patients we admitted in the year 2023. You could see that um, in the year 2023, and mostly in this part of the world, the number of patients are always on the increase when it is a farming or raining season. In January, we had just few number of patients that were admitted in the year 2023. We had 84 people. And in February, the same thing. But by the time we get to March, because at that point, people always go to the farms to make sure they clear their farms. And that's why you see that um, the number is actually increasing from 86 to 188. This will also, you can see it in April, morning to uh, a number of. This is because at this point, even though the people are always coming to the hospital, but when there is no anti snake venom for them to access, you discover that the mortality is always high. And that's why in July, the mortality has increased because the number of uh, and availability of uh, snake venom, the, the, uh, the anti-snake venom was not actually available for them to access it. And then you could also see that the number of people that were admitted has also drastically reduced from July. This is because most of the times, if the anti-snake venom is not available, they don't actually come to the hospital to access care because this issue of out-of-pocket expenses they are not always been able to get money to buy the anti-snake venom. Next slide, we can see it in the next graph. Next slide. From the graph, you can see that um, the blue is actually talking about the males. And all of them, by January, there is actually a flat movement of the curve to, to February. This is because the farming activities is actually less here. And by the time you come to March, you can see that the cough is actually going up. It is going up because at this point, there is a serious activity of clearing of the farms, also trying to go and get other things from the farm. And that's why you could see that the number has actually increased for men, for children, and also for the females. But you can see that immediately after March and April, the males and then the pediatrics, their own has also gone up. Where, whereas the females, the curve has actually gone down. This is because at this period, the males and the children are always going to the farm for clearance of the farm, while the females are not actually going to the farm at this point in time. Only by the time you come to April and May, you could see that the females also had a little increase in the number of patients that were admitted. This is because at this period, the, lady, the, male, the females we actually go to the bush to gather firewood and keep for the rainy season. Because by the time it is rainy season, they will not be able to go to the farm and gather firewood. So this is because of 
the activity of cutting firewood that has caused the females to actually increase. It moves, when you see it also going to July, this is the period where the males are actually uh, working seriously in the farm. And because it is also a rainy season, most of these reptiles, the snakes, as a result of the rain that is disturbing their houses, you see them coming out. And because they are coming out, you could see also that the, in, the, the contact and the encounter with the farmers and the headers is also on the increase. From July, the cough immediately dropped. This was what I was saying initially, that because there was no availability of anti-snake venom in the hospital, and that was why people refused actually to come to access care. Not because they don't want to come, but because they will not have enough money to be able to um, purchase the anti-snake venom. And then when you look at the cough also, it comes down to around uh, October, November. From October and November, the females also has a higher number of patients from the females. This is because they always go to the farm to gather the crops, particularly during harvest. And at this point, the women are always in the farm. And that's why it has also increased to this. So in summary, increase, we have increase of victims when it is raining season, increase of victims at the point when the harvest is going on and we have delay, I mean reduction when there is no activities in the farm. The challenges of this um, center are as follows. We are actually having the big challenge is that of anti-snake venom. And then, as we can see, when the anti-snake venom is available, there is actually a reduction in mortality. And when the anti-snake venom is no more, the, there is an increase in the mortality. We also have an issue of lack of um, electricity. And so these are some in the facility. Next slide. No. Next slide. These are areas we wish to have collaboration. The component of the provision of anti-snake venom. The thought is an area of mutual benefit, particularly in training and building the capacity of the staff. We'll be glad to have collaboration in these areas and many more. Next slide. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nuhu, for that wonderful presentation and for mentioning the potential areas of collaboration. So next we will hear um, from Sarah Padidar, who will discuss her work on reaching zero deaths from snake bite, um, Isotini's model of community-led prevention and treatment action. So I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, I think you might be muted. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Ashna. And thank you for your team for allowing me to present today. So reaching zero deaths from snake bite. Uh, this is uh, the accomplishment that we have done here in Eswatini this year. The season's not over, so but I, I am uh, hopeful that we will uh, remain zero for the rest of this season that will end in August this year. Just by way of affiliation, I am a lecturer here at the University of Eswatini. Um, I'm also a core member of the African Snake Bite Alliance. I see that Professor Steenstra is also on the call uh, today. Uh, she's also a core member along with colleagues from Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Malawi and the UK. Also the research director and a trustee of the Eswatini Anti-Venom Foundation. So just to provide a bit of a geography lesson, this is uh, Eswatini here down in Southern Africa. We border on our north, our west and our south uh, with South Africa. And on our east, we have Mozambique. We are landlocked. We've got 1.3 million people um, and uh, we have four distinct agro um, uh, agroecological zones. Uh, we are geographically diverse and what this allows us to do is to have suitable habitat for over 60 species of snakes across 39 genera. 
awesome if you're working in biodiversity, not so great when you're working in snake bite. Um, for those of you that have a delicate disposition, I recommend that you look away now. I've only got one slide with gruesome pictures and I will let you know when it's safe to look again. But um, back in 2006, before the Antivenom Foundation uh, existed, we had a 100% case fatality ratio uh, rate, uh, especially with our black mamba patients. Uh, the boy on the left here is a young boy that was bitten not by a black mamba, but by a cytotoxic snake a few years ago, and he sadly died uh, because of the lack of antivenom at the health facilities. The two pictures in the middle, uh, this is uh, thought to be a Mozambique spitting cobra bite. It has had surgery just to sort of take away some of the dead tissue, but you can see the impact of the cytotoxic venom all the way down to the bone, uh, as well as the bite here, this uh, limb here that has got characteristic blistering caused by puff adabite, and both of these patients received antivenom late. Um, Last year, we heard from colleagues, uh, last year, last week, sorry, we heard from colleagues um, about the typical actions of snake bite patients before they arrive at health facilities, and Eswatini is no different, with tourniquet occurring in 80% of our patients that do carry out some sort of first aid, seems to be a favorite, as well as uh, making incisions with the misguided idea that the venom can be bled out. Now, you can may return if you have a delicate disposition, gory pictures are over. This is data from, um, ranging from 2019 to 2021. Uh, it was published last year in 2023 in uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases. And um, again, Professor Steenstra and Professor Monagem are also I see on the call today who were also authors. Um, what we see is that we have um, both males and, well, we have more males uh, with a relative risk ratio of uh, 1.29. Um, uh, being bitten by snakes, and you can see that the pop, the, the age range is skewed to the youth, uh, with 55% of patients uh, being bitten below the age of 30. This is reflective of our youthful population here in Eswatini. However, the 10 to, 20, 10 to 19 year old patients they account for 25% of the pop of the bites, and uh, they have a higher relative risk ratio, so at 1.46%. Not quite sure what's happening there, but it does. Uh, uh, warrant a little bit of investigation. Now the map on the right is uh, Eswatini again. In purple you have the high elevation areas and in red uh, which is 1.25, uh, 1,250 uh, meters above sea level um, with the low elevation areas in red of less than 250. The little red dots are the number of patients that were bitten in these localities with the bigger the circle, the more patients that were bitten. And you can see all these dots are scattered around the country. And, and so our that there's no particular area that you are going to be at zero risk of uh, snake bite. However, we, analysis does show that if you have an increase of elevation by 100 meters, you have a 4% decrease in incidence of snake bite. Looking at who's getting bitten, uh, just like our previous speaker was alluding to, it is the diseases of poverty. So unemployed students, retirees, and those that are below um, the age of going to school, as well as the elementary occupation, uh, very um, low skilled uh, labor as well, being at high risk. I do like this slide because it also shows us who isn't getting bitten. And perhaps um, if the, the numbers were different, the snake bite would be very different around the world but that's me being cynical. So how did we look at risk modeling? And um, Robert Fuete last week uh, showed us how they looked at the risk of snake bite in uh, Kenya using the SERS model. I'm going to now introduce what, we'd, what we've done in Eswatini. And again, this was published last year. We look at hazards uh, and vulnerability, exposure and resource scarcity. I will go into each one in a, in a moment. Um, but where these four collide is where you're going to have the highest risk. And this has a strong geographical uh, component. And this was work that was done by uh, Dr. Wisdom Glamini. When we look at hazards, this is where are the snake bites occurring and where are, where are our venomous snakes? Vulnerability, just as our previous speaker spoke about, the demographics, the, the disease of poverty. We've got our youth, we've got our, um, we've got our elderly, um, and we've got the low socioeconomic um, society that is most vulnerable. 
from an environmental perspective, looking at the land, looking at its land use, uh, looking at its Shannon diversity and other environmental factors that increase the risk of snake bite or decreases. Um, and where looking at these three looks uh, we used we're able to build a risk to look at the risk of getting bitten when we add the resource scarcity so where are our health facilities how long does it take to get to these health facilities by road by foot uh, um, and accounting for the road um, conditions as well you can have an idea of the outcome of that snake so should you get bitten what is uh, the likelihood of having a poor or a good outcome so how did we find out where our species are? Well, thanks to funding from the UK High Commission here in Eswatini, together with the EU, we've trained over 100 community snake rescue volunteers that are trained to handle venomous and non-venomous snakes, how to identify them and how to pr provide rudimentary first aid. What happens is, is the snake that the public call our snake hotline. Uh, and should you have a snake in your home, in your workplace, up a tree, which is where snakes should be, but nevertheless, uh, our snake rescue volunteers are still deployed, uh, then they go and they remove the problematic snake. Sometimes the snake is something like a uh, python, uh, non-venomous but still unwanted um, and other times it can be a black mamba or a, or a brown house snake. What happens is, is that our snake rescue volunteers will tell us where they went and give us an, a, a, a location which we can then geocode as well as give us um, take a photograph of the snake which we can then use to identify. This data, together with GBIF data and survey data, was used to carry out, and this is work done by Professor Monagem, uh, to look at the distribution of venomous species um, in southern Africa. And again, as I said before, great for biodiversity. We've got 11 uh, species of venomous snakes here in Eswatini. Bit of a mission when you're working in snake bite. So our uh, areas most um, where we've got all the venomous species is 11 and then our lowest area is eight. So we're not that diverse, um, but we do have, sorry, we're, we're not that different across our country. Uh, we, we range from eight to 11 venomous species. So what we did was we took um, the various indices of uh, risk, whether that is having an outside toilet, whether you've got running water, be um, earning less than two dollars a day what sort of land use you've got the population density what type of housing all the different variables that we know that can um, affect your risk of snake bite rather than assuming that the whole population has the same risk and together with the data that we had from the snake bite cases which we geocoded along with the snake sightings and um, where we have known historically where the snakes are we were able to integrate this data and to carry out a similarity seed analysis um, to be able to look for a particular area or a um, polygon of, of the of the country to be able to carry out a um, a multivariate cluster analysis and this created the maps. You may have been familiar with this uh, during COVID where you had your green zones, your yellow zones and your red zones. And our green zones here are uh, where you are low risk, not no risk, but low risk of snake bite. And they coincide with our very urbanized areas, our sort of concrete jungle. And then the red areas which surround these urban areas tend to be um, uh, where we've got high density population, but together with some sort of farming, whether you have your maize field and your chickens and some uh, goats and um, other components, that uh, other um, land uses that will attract rodents that therefore will attract the snakes. Adding in the hospitals and uh, where there is anti-venom, you can see just a very slight difference in the maps again, um, but to say that the risk of having a poor outcome is pretty high across the country. This allows us to then be able to target where our resources are going to be. So as I say to my students, what is the so what of this? Well, we know where our snakes are biting, we know who they are biting, what time of day and how, um, and we know where the highest risks are. But with limited resources, we're able to then carry out South prevention activities. And Hiral uh, last week very eloquently described what they're doing in South Africa. And it's, not, it's almost identical to what we're doing here. 
uh, were able to carry out, this is a picture of Zakela speaking to uh, school children about snakes. We do take snakes with us, non-venomous ones, obviously, um, for them to hold and to, to, uh, to break down some of those myths. We've got our snake rescue volunteers. They have been the backbone of the work that we've done. Um, and here we have Seema, who is uh, one of our uh, first a set of trained snake handlers and she is um, handling a black mamba here that was caught inside a chicken coop. Uh, it also allows us to figure out where we want our antivenoms to be placed rather than having them at our national referral hospital uh, in the capital. Uh, we should be having them placed perhaps uh, uh, in areas which have a high risk of snake bite. Um, so this has been very much community led uh, through the Antivenom Foundation and through the uh, patient um, population. We just had our first uh, snake bite uh, survivor meeting um, to be able to then continue this work uh, to be able to provide the education to demystify um, and, and, and also to continue removing and then uh, relocating. It's not just uh, removal permanent, but it is a relocation of these venomous snakes to somewhere that is safe for both the snake as well as uh, the patient. So with that, I'd like to end and thank uh, all of our sponsors uh, that has made our work here in Eswatini um, successful and hopefully we will continue to have zero deaths. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll just take a moment to see if Nuhu was able to get back on the call. I don't think he was. Okay. Oh, I think that might be him. Hi, Nuhu. Yeah. yeah, hello. Oh, we aren't able to hear you very well. Wait, wait, sorry. Are you able to maybe take out the, the headset? Sorry. I don't think we're able to hear him very well. Perhaps we can move on to Julianne's presentation and then um, we'll see if we're able to hear him. Yeah, I think that's probably best. And and Nuhu, what we can propose is that we, um, we record your presentation and then I can add that into the, the edit of this of this webinar subsequently. Um, but I suggest we pass on to Julianne right now. Sure. So we'll... Okay. I see Julian's ready. Yes, he'll be okay. discussing. Yeah. Ah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So uh, thank you for, for thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me uh, to, um, to, to present today about uh, our experience. Okay, so so um, just so this presentation was prepared by myself uh, as well as my colleagues Gabriel Alcoba, who, who uh, is another uh, a snake bite uh, expert inside MSF, uh, and we are going to speak uh, about our experience in treating snake bite, but also uh, conducting uh, operational operational research. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, an overview uh, of the. Um, this is an overview of the, the, the activities that we are, um, the projects where we have a lot of cases and a lot of admission uh, caused by snake bite. Um, you can see that uh, there are three uh, major countries where we admit a lot of uh, uh, patients with snake bite and venoming in Yemen, in, uh, in Ethiopia, and in South Sudan. Uh, but of course, uh, there are all, also other countries uh, where we admit uh, um, cases of snake bite, like Sudan, Central African Republic, Kenya. Nigeria, Syria, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, uh, and others. Uh, most of our operations uh, are in um, remote areas or in uh, 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 regions that are afflicted by uh, by conflicts. Uh, um, and um, uh, and generally speaking, so on an annual basis, we we treat, we admit, sorry, um, more than seven thousand uh, cases of snake bite. And um, less than 40% of them actually need antivenom therapy. Um, so um, um, more than 50% of them uh, do not need uh, th uh, antivenom therapy because it's either mild and venoming or dry bites. Um, and uh, and our case fatality rate uh, is a, is estimated to be uh, below 1%, probably below 0.5% uh, globally. Next slide. 
So our, uh, this is what we do. And the main activity that we conduct in the field is clinical management uh, in, in small hospitals or in hospitals. Uh, so we diagnose uh, systemic envenoming and uh, very often we use uh, the whole blood uh, clotting test, which is a, a very simple test that is uh, helpful to um, to um, to properly diagnose uh, um, uh, coagul coagulopathies associated with uh, envenoming. Um, and uh, of course, we provide treatment, anti-venom treatment for sure, but other other also uh, supportive kind of care through blood transfusion, intensive care in case of uh, of a very severe envenomings and um, respiratory support when it's available, as well as surgery, uh, particularly in cases of uh, necrosis. And we also try to conduct other types of activities that are not centered around hospitals, but um, that's not... Um, we, these other activities are less developed inside uh, our model, inside inside MSF. So uh, through our networks of um, of um, uh, community health centers or primary health centers, sometimes we we contribute to first aid and referral. We conduct community sensitization in uh, in uh, regions with a very high incidence. Uh, we try to um, to develop some activities uh, after discharge uh, because we know that patients may suffer from sequelae, including a post a post -dis uh, post stress disorder. Uh, uh, so um, so it's 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 important to um, um, to, to to develop uh, a mental health and uh, supportive activities uh, following the, the discharge. We've been engaged as well in the past in training activities uh, and also, and this is what I will speak about uh, today, operational research. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I will go through very quickly uh, the different uh, types of uh, publications that we've been engaged into. Huh? Uh, so uh, if you want to find more details, you you have the references in, uh, in my presentation. Uh, but first, we've uh, we've published a, a few a few uh, publications about our general experience, which is very much, as I said in my introduction, uh, located in uh, in areas with um, of conflicts or, or of humanitarian uh, um, disasters. Um, and the take home messages uh, from our experience is that the burden of snake bite and venoming in humanitarian settings is very high uh, and maybe underestimated. And more research is needed um, uh, to explore uh, and to better understand the as potential associations between the risk of snake bite and uh, a natural disaster. Uh, that's one, but also the risk of snake bite and population displacement. Um, there may be some uh, some associations here that uh, need to be further investigated. Next slide. We've also been involved into uh, some uh, epidemi epidemiological analysis and uh, and uh, and uh, surveys, as well as as uh, development of different models of care that we've tried to describe. Um, uh, this this has been done in in South Sudan, uh, uh, in uh, in Nepal as well, in collaboration with other organizations. And uh, in that field, the take home messages are that uh, the the true burden uh, in the community is often much higher than what you can find in hospital records because a lot of uh, snake bite victims do not reach hospitals for some reason. Uh, so there is a need for retrospective uh, community-based epidemiological, ep epidemiological studies to have a better uh, um, estimation of the true burden of uh, snake bite uh, in a given uh, region. And uh, uh, hospital-centered activities are not enough. Huh? As I said in my introduction, it's important to deploy as well some programs uh, before admission into the hospital and after discharge as well. We've been involved on a few occasions in clinical assessment of antivenoms. Uh, we've done that uh, particularly in Ethiopia, in our uh, hospital in, uh, in Abdurafi, in Northwest Ethiopia, where MSF admits uh, more than 1,500 uh, cases every year. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, uh, what, what we have found is that uh, uh, there is a varying um, uh, clinical safety, varying levels of uh, uh, clinical safety and effectiveness uh, between the different antivenom products. Um, so we've been involved in uh, in single harm studies most mo most often, uh, not in comparative studies, unfortunately, because it's quite difficult to implement a randomized clinical uh, trial. Uh, it requires a lot of resources, and so far we haven't been able to do that. So we try to provide non-RCT data. Uh, this is uh, useful evidence 
but there is still a need, uh, I think, to um, to collaborate with other groups in order to organize robust randomized uh, control trials to compare the different antivenoms between themselves. And in that sense, we have contributed to, um, to a consortium that has uh, recently published a global core outcome uh, measurement set for snake bite clinical trials and trying to harmonize the different endpoints and the different indicators that should be used uh, in the future uh, in clinical trials for snake bite. Next slide. Surgery is another activity that uh, on some occasions we, we uh, our, our colleagues in the field can uh, can practice and can uh, and can describe. And uh, we've had uh, a few publications uh, uh, about uh, 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 surgery uh, following uh, uh, very severe cases uh, of of snake bite. Uh, and uh, the take home messages here is that uh, the management of venom induced necrosis is challenging but it is feasible in resource limited settings uh, uh, according to our experience. Next. And we also uh, are involved into uh, analysis of, uh, of, uh, of policies related to snake bite, particularly on antivenom access, as well as uh, uh, innovation uh, towards uh, um, second generation antivenom for treatment of snake bite. Um, we've had a look at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the pipeline uh, of, uh, of new products and we've also tried to analyze all the different uh, obstacles with regards to access to quality uh, assured uh, uh, effective antivenoms in the different regions of the world. We've done that in collaborations with uh, with other groups. Uh, it's not only MSF, of course. Uh, the take home messages here is that uh, uh, most antivenoms, unfortunately, are, are brought uh, to the market uh, without any kind of uh, robust clinical data. And in some cases, um, the uh, the antivenom producers have not undergone uh, 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 either some uh, some audits uh, with regards to good manufacturing practices. So much more needs to be done um, to um, to um, to improve the quality assurance system for antivenom and to confirm the safety and the effectiveness of the different products. Another important message is that out of pocket expenses uh, represent uh, a major access barrier. In many countries around the world, not everywhere, but in many countries, uh, the snake bite victims, they have to pay the full costs of the antivenom themselves out of their pockets. And as a result, uh, they can only afford uh, maybe uh, just one vial or a couple of vials, no more. So they receive substandard treatment or suboptimal treatment for sure. Uh, I need to mention that in, uh, in the MSF projects, uh, um, uh, treatment for snake bite and, and other, other conditions, by the way, is, is free of charge. Huh? So we don't have that specific problem in our, in our programs, but, uh, uh, but in many settings, it is a, it is a major, major obstacle. Next. So we've got uh, other other studies that are either ongoing or, or getting being, being prepared. Sorry, uh, in Ethiopia, we'd like to have a better understanding of the health-seeking behaviors. Uh, uh, in Ethiopia, we have operations in a in a in a region uh, in the country where there's a lot of uh, um, uh, agricultural work that is uh, that is done by a migrant agricultural worker. Uh, so um, uh, these people live in a relatively difficult conditions uh, uh, in in the farms, uh, and uh, and we want to better understand the, the risk factors and also um, uh, the, the, the the what happens after the bitten and uh, and why in some in some cases it takes them so long to 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 reach the hospital. So a better better description of the, the health seeking behaviors will be helpful. Uh, in Ethiopia as well, due to the very high caseload, we may uh, be involved in a in single harm uh, clinical study with antivenoms. Uh, that's something that we can do uh, because we can quickly collect some relatively good clinical data uh, about the safety uh, of the different antivenoms that we use. Uh, in South Sudan, we have started a new project uh, about snake identification, and uh, we are going to 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 use. Um, uh, um, um, uh, a tool uh, on, on, on the on the mobile phones that is uh, uh, mediated and uh, that driven by uh, artificial intelligence to uh, to um, to improve uh, our capacity to um, to recognize uh, and identify the the snake species that have been uh, 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 causing um, um, the snake bite. Uh, so based on photographs that can be brought by the patients, or sometimes in many cases the patient, the victims themselves, and the family they, they bring uh, the dead snake to the to the facility. So based on that, uh, that could be uh, helpful to um to uh, to identify um, the, the the snake species. And finally, in Cameroon, a large uh, epidemiological study should be uh, published anytime soon by my colleague Gabriel Koba, who I think is on 
maybe among the participants. So stay tuned. It should be um, it should be released uh, uh, in in the coming months. So this is more or less what we do. I just wanted to bring this overview to the rest of the participants, and of course, I'm happy to reply to any questions. And if you're interested into any kind of collaboration in one of the countries where we have where we have some um, a large number of operations, that's something we we can discuss, of course. So thank you for 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 for, for inviting me and. Uh, and um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for a great presentation, Julian. I see there's some questions in the chat. If I can just encourage folks um, to put questions in the Q&A and then speakers can um, engage with you there. Um, next up, we will hear from Dr. Tiki Marcos Badore, who is an, interest, an assistant professor at Wachemo University. So he will be discussing the burden and outcome of snake bites in three selected hospitals in Ethiopia. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Teki Marcos and from uh, Wachamu Hospital and uh, Warabi Comprehensive Specialized Hospital. And I'm going to present uh, the burden and incidence, burden or incidence on the outcome of snake bites in three uh, selected hospitals. That was my proposal. And the next slide, please. And uh, when uh, it was uh, uh, going to uh, Share and uh, and uh, when uh, it was uh, snake bite is neglected tropical Africa disease and it annually kills around 88 80, 000, 30, so 138,000 and people rising in some of the worlds and uh, which leads and uh, the surviving uh, victims were permanent and physical disabilities and some disfiguring and some uh, physiologic derangements. Africa and Asia's community, particularly and most commonly, and uh, uh, most common economic uh, impoverished groups are most vulnerable for these uh, attacks. And SNF bites is both a consequence and a cause of tropical diseases. And uh, next slide. And an estimated around uh, 5.4 uh, million people so were are beaten by a snake bite each year, and uh, 2.5 million cases of envelope. Are there and around uh, okay, uh, around uh, 81 to 410 to uh, 81,410 to one 137 million people are dying in each year. And global warden and uh, Venus uh, snakes can cause paralysis and the bleeding disorders and rivers kidney and organ derangements. And agriculture workers and the children are most vulnerable and the children most suffer when compared to other population groups. And in Venom are most commonly affects women, children, and farmers in poor rural areas like our countries in Ethiopia. And the highest burden of course in countries where health systems are weakest and uh, poor resource uh, areas, in contrast to many uh, other serious health conditions, highly effective treatments cannot be exist, and most uh, deaths and the serious consequences of uh, snake bites are entirely preventable and making safe and effective anti uh, anti venoms more uh, widely available and accessible. And when we come to high quality or high quality snake. Uh, venoms, anti-venoms are the most effective treatment to prevent or reverse the most common complications. And as it was listed on the most common WHO list of essential medications, and uh, the cause of uh, negligence or some uh, inaccessibility or weak health systems and the lack of data and a combination of strategic risk-based placement, anti-venom, suitable healthcare staffing and available of affordable medications our uh, medications are the most common <clears throat> inaccessible conditions. And uh, in uh, situations where data on uh, snake uh, bias in venom are uh, difficult, accurately determine the need for antivenom, and that leads to underestimation of antivenom needs by national health authorities. And when uh, the my statement of the problem was the prevalence and the burden of systemic bias in Ethiopia was not clearly known, and there are scarcity of data on outcome of snake bites in Ethiopia, and there was 
not adequate research done in the area of snake bites in Ethiopia and the developing countries like Ethiopia. And uh, the main objective was uh, to study the uh, aim of the determining the outcome of snake bites in selected hospitals in three selected hospitals like uh, Warabi Comprehensive Specialized Hospital, uh, Butajra General Hospital, and the uh, Wachamo uh, uh, University Hospitals. And uh, the specific objectives to determine the prevalence of snake bites data as the snake bite data as the Siri hospital and to investigate the administration administration status of the snake bites, whether uh, early administration or administered or not, and to assess complication of snake bites like any systemic involvement. And the study area was the Siri hospitals as mentioned above and the Wachamo, Warabi, and Butajira Hospital. The study designs, and uh, this study will be observational, observational based uh, cross-sectional study, and institutional based observational cross-sectional study. Uh, and variables are social democratic factors, prevalence of the snake bites, administration of antivenoms, complications and the outcomes could be the dependent variables. And snake bites data will be collected from the patient mRNA both during ED admission and the discharge from the hospital. A questionnaire will be collected and expected outcomes and the prevalence of snake bites in this selected hospital, rate of uh, antivenom administration at ED and in the three hospital, the status of the outcome uh, or, or whether discharged or days or complications will be studied. And this is my, my reference on my original proposal. And <clears throat> this is my study uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tiki, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll just check real quick if uh, Smaila Alidu is, is on the call today. So Smaila is, is a global health student at the University of Montreal and we'll be discussing the epidemiological and therapeutic profile of snake bite cases at the Mango Prefectural Hospital OT district from 2013 to 2017. So please note that this presentation will be in French. Um, so if you'd like to listen to it in English or Spanish, just please ensure that you've selected the correct translation from the tool toolbar below. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Smila. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup à tous. Merci pour cette opportunité que vous me donnez de, de faire cette présentation. Il faut que l'on situe la, le contexte de cette présentation. Au fait, c'est euh, une étude que nous avons réalisée au début de notre carrière quand on était dans le district de Loti, au nord du Togo, où nous étions responsables de la surveillance épidémiologique. Et là, nous avons commencé par faire des formations euh, d'informations de renforcement de capacité. Et donc, après une formation, il était question de, de présenter quelque chose. Et donc, nous avons vu que la question de monsieur des serpents n'était pas vraiment abordée à, à l'époque dans nos conférences. Et donc, nous avons choisi de regarder qu'est-ce qui se passe réellement et en ce qui concerne le monsieur des serpents. Parce que de temps en temps, nous avons des décès liés au monsieur des serpents dans notre district. Voilà. Donc, euh, après cette formation, ça nous a donné des opportunités où nous avons eu à faire euh, une maîtrise en sciences épidémiologiques. Et actuellement, nous sommes à l'Université de Montréal où nous faisons euh, un diplôme en santé mondiale. Et donc, euh, en tant que diplôme, diplôme étudiant en santé mondiale, nous pensons que la question est vraiment d'actualité parce que ça fait partie des maladies tropicales négligées. Merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, bon, nous allons suivre le plan que voici. C'est quoi la situation actuellement euh, des morceaux du, du serpent au Togo? Nous avons essayé de regarder dans, sur le net pour voir quelle était vraiment la situation. Et nous avons vu ce rapport qui date de 2021 de l'OMS, qui montre qu'au Togo, l'incident des morceaux des serpents était autour de 44 euh, cas pour 100 000 euh, habitants. Donc, vous voyez la situation. Et donc, nous avons aussi regardé, est-ce que ça se parle, la, le morceau de serpent, ça se parle au Togo. Et nous avons regardé, il y a eu des presses qui montrent qu'il y a eu des enfants, qui sont un enfant qui est mort tout récemment eh, par morceau de serpent, par manque 
d'antivenimeux. Donc, et puis même ça a causé même qu'on a, on a même radié du personnel de santé parce que on pense qu'ils n'ont pas bien pris soin de l'enfant et que l'enfant est décédé. Alors que la cause réelle, c'est qu'il y a eu euh, retard au recours de soins et après le retard arrivé au niveau des structures de santé, il y a un manque de, des antivenumeux et donc l'enfant était obligé d'être renvoyé dans un centre à plus plusieurs kilomètres, donc jusqu'à l'arrivée, l'enfant est décédé. Cette situation, tout le, tous ceux qui ont passé, même la semaine passée, cette semaine, l'ont dit, c'est une situation vraiment qui, qui, qui fait mourir les enfants, les victimes de morsures de serpents dans nos pays. Merci. Donc, euh, je parle de district de Loti. C'est quoi? C'est un district qui est situé au nord du Togo. Et, oh, la population n'est pas trop grande. Et, mais le climat est de type sahélien. Euh, le climat est de type sahélien. Nous avons la végétation aussi euh, persémée de, de bois et de toutes tout choses. Quels sont les types de serpents que nous pouvons trouver dans ce district? On a les types, les, les serpents, les espèces élapidées et les viparidées. Donc voilà les familles que nous avons au niveau du district de Loti. C'est vrai qu'il n'y a pas... C est, c est, c est, il y a, ça fait longtemps qu'on a identifié ces, ces familles, mais il n'y a pas des études récentes qui montrent vraiment qu'est-ce que nous avons. Et dans le district de Loti, euh, c'est les activités les plus euh, pratiquées sont l'agriculture et l'élevage. Donc, euh, comme je le disais tantôt, nous avons essayé de voir, euh, de faire une analyse secondaire des données euh, au niveau de l'hôpital de district, un hôpital de district. Euh, où nous avons regardé qu'est-ce qui s'est passé pour les monstres de serpent de 2013 à 2017. Donc, euh, il s'agit d'une étude euh, secondaire, d'une analyse de base, où nous avons regardé tout ce qui s'est passé depuis ce, ce moment. Donc, tous les patients qui ont été admis et puis qui ont un dossier vraiment qu'on peut exploiter ont été euh, pris et nous avons regardé qu'est-ce qui s'est passé, quelles sont les données qu'on peut exploiter. Donc, euh, comme je vous le disais tantôt, nous avons essayé de regarder, nous avons vu comme résultat qu'on a l'âge moyen des patients qui étaient là, l'âge moyen, l'âge médian par exemple était de 28 ans et l'âge le plus touché était de 15 à 29 ans. Donc, euh, c'est les, les hommes qui étaient les plus touchés, comme l'a démontré la plupart des, des présentations. Et les gens qui étaient les plus touchés aussi en ce qui concerne les activités, c'était les, les agriculteurs, ceux qui étaient en contact avec euh, la bourse, donc euh, les agriculteurs et, et les, les éleveurs. Bon, en ce qui concerne euh, euh, sur le plan éducation, vous savez, nous sommes avec les données secondaires dans les hôpitaux où il n'y a pas vraiment de rigueur pour les collègues des données. Donc, on avait des, eu beaucoup de problèmes pour pouvoir... Il y avait, pour le plan, euh, sur le plan éducation, il y avait des données qui n'étaient pas vraiment enregistrées. Euh, bon, en ce qui concerne les cas enregistrés au cours des années de 2013 à 2017, nous avons eu, sur 215 cas, nous avons eu seulement à exploiter 117 et 170 euh, euh, dossiers dû à des dossiers manquants, dû vraiment aussi à des données qui manquent les, le personnel ne prenait pas vraiment soin parce que ce n'est pas un problème, et ce n'était pas euh, un sujet vraiment d'actualité où il y avait vraiment un regard dedans. Donc, euh, chacun, quand, chacun fait comme il veut et les données qu'il a, il les met. Donc, vous, vous, avez, vous allez voir qu'entre 2013 et 2017, euh, 2014, pardon, il y a eu vraiment euh, une diminution des cas. Ce n'est pas une diminution des cas liée au fait qu'il n'y a plus de cas. C'est parce que en 2014, entre 2013 et 2014, il y a création d'un hôpital euh, de mission américain. Donc, ça a fait que tous les patients étaient dirigés vers là parce que quand ils arrivaient, il y avait, il y avait les antivenumeux là-bas. Il y avait aussi, ils peuvent arriver, faire les soins et après payer. Alors que dans l'hôpital dans où nous travaillons, c'est un hôpital d'État. Quand tu viens, tu dois payer. Et des fois, les gens ont trouvé vraiment un problème d'aller vers ce côté. Nous avons aussi essayé de regarder qu'est-ce qui se passe en ce qui concerne euh, les cas, c'est à quel moment du mois vraiment les cas sont enregistrés. Vous, vous allez regarder, vous allez voir ensemble avec moi, 
que les cas étaient vraiment enregistrés à partir de juin, juillet, jusqu'à euh, au niveau de novembre. Donc, ce sont des moments de, de récolte parce que dans cette région, les, plus, les premières pluies vraiment commencent déjà euh, à partir de fin mars, fin mars et mai. Donc déjà au moment de mai, juin, nous sommes au moment, de la, moment intense de l'agriculture et les récoltes commencent déjà à partir de septembre à novembre. Donc c'est au cours de cette période, comme l'a démontré les autres qui ont présenté avant moi, c'est au cours de cette période qu'il y a une interaction entre les humains il y a plus d'interactions entre les humains et les espèces et, et, et les serpents. Donc voilà, c'est en ce moment aussi qu'on a plus de monstres de serpents. Et nous avons essayé de regarder, voilà, une carte que j'ai faite à l'époque. Vraiment, quand je la regarde, je suis encore fier parce qu'à l'époque, on n'avait pas trop de notions sur la cartographie, mais on a essayé. Et donc, tout, dans tous les districts où j'ai montré les, les, les cantons, il y avait les cas partout. Il n'y avait pas, que tout part, on peut dire qu'il n'y avait pas de cas. Donc, les cas étaient éparpillés, ce qui montre que le risque zéro dans ce district-là n'existe pas. Et si nous voulons extrapoler, c'est partout au Togo, dans tous les coins, il y a le risque de monstres de serpent. Donc, euh, c'est quoi les activités qui impliquent le monstres de serpent? Vous l'avez déjà, je l'avais déjà dit. Donc, c'est les activités liées au champ, les activités liées au champ pour les femmes, c'est les activités liées au champ pour les récoltes. Et aussi pour le ramassage, euh, la recherche des bois de chauffe, ce sont les activités qui étaient vraiment euh, impliquées. Donc, euh, comme je le disais tantôt, c'est où? Où est-ce que les gens étaient vraiment, étaient vraiment euh, à risque? Donc, c'est dans les champs et sur la route vers les champs. Euh, ils étaient, les, vous m'excusez pour la répétition de ces, ces, diapos, ces, ces données. Donc, c'est quand, à quel moment les, les gens étaient vraiment victimes. Euh, dans la journée, on a vu que c'était dans la matinée que les gens étaient vraiment victimes des monstres de serpents. Euh, nous avons essayé de regarder aussi qu'est-ce qui se passe quand les gens sont mordus par les serpents. Est-ce qu'ils prennent le temps directement de venir vers les hôpitaux? Et donc, nous avons mis notre délai pour dire que, bon, ils sont vite arrivés. Et nous avons mis à l'époque que s'ils sont arrivés 6 heures après leur monstre, cela veut dire qu'ils sont arrivés entre 1 heure à 6 heures avant leur morsure de serpent. Nous disons que bon, ils sont vite arrivés. Et donc, nous avons regardé et nous avons remarqué que la plupart des, des gens mordus venaient à l'hôpital, venaient à l'hôpital 6 heures après leur morsure de serpent. Et qu'est-ce qui se passe? Les gens, ils arrivent à l'hôpital seulement dans des situations compliquées. Leur première intention, c'est d'aller vers les les, euh, comment appelle-t-on, les soignants traditionnels. Donc, euh, ils arrivent à l'hôpital après avoir fait des soins au niveau traditionnel. C'est quand ça ne marche pas qu'ils arrivent. Donc, euh, on a aussi essayé de regarder les grades et quel qu'en soit ce qu'on dit, il y avait les gens qui venaient quand même avec euh, des morsures blanches qui n'avaient pas de problème. Donc, il y avait qui étaient là au, au niveau de grade 1 et vous, allez, vous avez vu aussi, il y avait des grades extrêmes aussi. Donc, euh, il y a une répétition. Qu'est-ce que nous allons retenir dans euh, cette présentation? Euh, il faut noter qu'il y a, au niveau de, du Togo, comme dans le district de l'Otu, nous avons, il y, a, il y a des monstres de serpents tout le temps. Et la plupart des personnes victimes sont des agriculteurs, les agriculteurs, pardon, et les éleveurs. Et la majorité de ces gens-là font recours premièrement aux, aux, aux soins traditionnels. Et la plupart des gens qui meurent, sont, ce sont des gens qui, qui arrivent tardivement euh, à l'hôpital. Donc, nous, nous tenons vraiment à remercier à l'époque ceux qui nous ont donné euh, cette, euh, cette envie de faire l'épidémiologie et de se donner à la santé publique. Donc, nous remercions le, le gouvernement togolais qui avait accepté cette formation. Et à l'époque, c'était CCISD qui est devenu maintenant Santé mondiale Canada. Et nous remercions aussi l'AES. Donc, euh, et comme je le disais tantôt, nous sommes actuellement en train de faire euh, une formation en santé mondiale. Le problème de mon sud des serpents est un problème vraiment qui tient à cœur. Les perspectives, si on a des collaborations, c'est de voir quelle est la situation vraiment réelle de, de mon sud des serpents au Togo, par des enquêtes peut-être populationnelles ou bien au niveau même des hôpitaux pour voir la situation. Et 
euh, avec ça, on aura peut-être des données qui montrent vraiment euh, la chronologie des morsures des serpents au cours de l'année et prévoir les antivéneurs pour pouvoir prendre soin et réduire les décès liés euh, à, 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 aux morsures des serpents. Merci beaucoup, je vous remercie tous. Merci beaucoup, Smaila. That was a wonderful presentation. Next, we will hear from Lina Maria Peña Acevedo, who will be talking about infection diagnosis in victims of snake bites in Colombia. So like the previous presentation, Lina's presentation is going to be in Spanish. So if you would like to hear it in English or French, please ensure that you've selected the correct translation from the toolbar below. And with that, I'll hand it to you, Lina. Thank you. Muy buenos días para todos. Muchas gracias al equipo de Global Team por invitarme el día de hoy a esta reunión y permitirme presentar mi propuesta de investigación. Yo actual, yo soy toxicóloga clínica, eh, médica toxicóloga clínica. Soy profesora titular en una universidad, en la Universidad de Antioquia en Medellín, Colombia, y actualmente curso un doctorado en investigación clínica, en medicina clínica. Eh, como parte de mi propuesta doctoral, yo estoy eh, desarrollando una, un proyecto de investigación eh, que pretende encontrar o desarrollar, más que encontrar, desarrollar una escala para el diagnóstico clínico de la infección en mordedura de serpiente. Esa es la, lo que voy a mostrarles eh, un poco el día de hoy. Eh, como les decía, yo vivo en Colombia. Colombia es un país ubicado en Sudamérica. Eh, tenemos eh, principalmente eh, dos eh, grupos importantes de serpientes, las víboras y los elápidos. Dentro de, los, eh, dentro de las víboras tenemos tres géneros distribuidos en 21 especies y dentro de estas 21 especies las más importantes son eh, la, la mayor, el mayor número de casos eh, de mordeduras de serpiente que se presentan en nuestro país son producidas por las serpientes del grupo Botrop, especialmente la Botrop atros y la Botrop aster. Colombia es un país que tiene todos los pisos térmicos, <coughs> tenemos desiertos, tenemos nevados y tenemos bosque tropical húmedo y seco, que es eh, el, la, el sitio ideal para que las víboras eh, vivan en unas eh, óptimas condiciones. En Colombia se presentan en promedio entre 4.500, 5.500 mordeduras de serpientes cada año. Esto eh, representa una incidencia eh, anual de eh, cerca de 10.78 por 100.000 habitantes y tenemos entre eh, 50, 30 y 50 muertos cada año. Eh, lo que eh, representa una letalidad inferior al 1%. En Colombia disponemos de suero antiofídico, eh, antiveneno, para cubrir ambos eh, grupos de serpientes. Tenemos suero para cubrir, eh, antiveneno para cubrir las mordeduras de, víbor de víboras y tenemos suero para eh, eh, contrarrestar los efectos del veneno de los elápidos. Ambos sueros son producidos por eh, el gobierno nacional y además tenemos la posibilidad de eh, autorización de usar sueros importados de otros países. Eh, actualmente tenemos un, un uso del suero en el 82% de las mordeduras. Eh, la frecuencia eh, por, por tipo de, de agente agresor, de familia, entonces cerca del 68% de las mordeduras son por las víboras, eh, y tenemos un eh, porcentaje cercano al 30%, al 23% de, eh, de eh, etiología no identificada, porque eh, la persona no pudo identificar, eh, la víctima no pudo identificar cuál fue la serpiente que lo mordió. Como igual que han mostrado otros panelistas el día de hoy, pues el eh, la persona que típicamente es mordida por una serpiente es una persona eh, es un hombre dedicado a actividades relacionadas con la agricultura o con el trabajo en el campo. El 70%, un poco más de estos eh, accidentes o estos eventos ocurren en zonas rurales. Eh, el 62% ocurren en los miembros inferiores y cerca de un 30% de estas personas manipulan la lesión o, o se cortan 
eh, se queman o eh, toman bebidas o, o acuden donde curanderos. Eh, si bien eh, un, cerca de un 35% de estas 40 personas, por ciento de estas personas están entre los 20 y los 39 años, el 25% son mayores de 50 años. La principal complicación de estas eh, mordeduras, la principal complicación local de las mordeduras de víboras en, en Colombia es la infección. Y eh, pues según los diferentes estudios, las infecciones eh, globalmente ocurren entre un 9 y un 77% de los casos. Esta variabilidad en la frecuencia de infección, que es pues, del 9 al 77%, es muy alta, eh, tiene varias explicaciones como voy a mostrarles a continuación. Eh, según las diferentes estadísticas, no solamente en mi país, sino obtenidas de la literatura internacional, pues eh, los abscesos pueden presentarse hasta casi en un 70% de los casos, la celulitis hasta en un 21% de los casos y eh, las necrosis hasta en un 2-3% de los casos. Pero estas frecuencias pueden variar dependiendo del país y del estudio donde esta estadística eh, se recolecte. En mi país, eh, en promedio, se infectan entre un 30 y un 40% de los pacientes según los diferentes estudios realizados en los hospitales de alta complejidad. Las bacterias, pues, eh, usualmente eh, son eh, gérmenes gram negativos entéricos que eh, habitan la boca o el veneno de la serpiente. Y por destacar, pues eh, en mi país son más importantes la aromona hidrófila y la morganela morgani como las eh, bacterias que más frecuentemente eh, se aíslan de, estos, de estas infecciones. Las víboras pues tienen un veneno que al, además de producir alteraciones de la coagulación, eh, tienen efecto miotóxico y proteolítico, eh, lo cual favorece eh, que eh, en presencia de las bacterias del veneno o de la boca de la serpiente o las de la piel de la víctima, pues, se desarrollen infecciones en estos sitios donde la serpiente muerde. Eh, una de las razones por las cuales la variabilidad en la, en, en la frecuencia de la infección es tan alta, es una de las razones es que es, ha sido muy difícil eh, hacer un diagnóstico preciso de la infección. ¿Por qué? Porque eh, estos son casos de pacientes que tienen este, esta primera foto de la izquierda, es un paciente eh, mordido por una u otro Casper, eh, vemos las clitenas, el gran edema, la, el eritema, el edema, la inflamación. Eh, y aquí puede ser muy difícil saber si un paciente tiene una infección de tejidos blandos o no la tiene. Eh, un médico que no tenga mucha experiencia como en, en este tipo de casos en diagnosticar la infección eh, puede confundir esto que es toxicidad local del veneno, este eritema que se ve como en parches, como moteado, esto es toxicidad del veneno, pero puede ser muy difícil para un médico joven o un médico inexperto diferenciar o no tener la certeza de que esto es una infección o esto es toxicidad local. Y muchas veces las personas se manipulan, entonces eh, tampoco es fácil saber solo a, por, eh, eh, pues, viendo la lesión si esto es por la manipulación, este paciente se quemó, entonces si este eritema y este edema y esta costra que se ve acá son por la manipulación, por la quemadura que se hizo el paciente, o si el paciente está desarrollando una infección, o si es una mezcla de todos los anteriores, el veneno, la manipulación, la quemadura más la infección. Puede ser muy difícil saber acá cuál es la realidad. Entonces, no hay criterios diagnósticos bien definidos para el diagnóstico de una infección en mordedura de serpiente. Las manifestaciones clínicas eh, son indistinguibles entre la toxicidad del veneno y la infección, por lo cual es muy difícil hacer el diagnóstico diferencial y esto ha hecho que se dé un alto uso de antibióticos mal llamados profilácticos para prevenir la infección, eh, porque entonces uno encuentra en la literatura que se usan esquemas que no son profilácticos. Eh, porque son tratamientos eh, o esquemas de antibióticos que se dan por 3, 5, 7 días, lo cual se sale del concepto eh, de profilaxis, porque la profilaxis lo que quiere es prevenir y, se, y la, la, los esquemas profilácticos eh, usuales eh, no duran más de 24 o 48 horas, pero lo que uno encuentra en la literatura es que con un fin profilástico, es de, decir, de prevenir, se dan esquemas por 3, 5, 7, incluso más días. Y lo otro que sucede es que ante esta incertidumbre de no saber si es toxicidad o eh, infección, entonces se, se han utilizado esquemas de antibióticos que eh, están 
están eh, indicados, por ejemplo, para las mordeduras por animales domésticos, como las mordeduras de perros y gatos, y se usan antibióticos como la eh, ampicilina sulbactam, que pues no cubren los, los gérmenes que yo previamente les mostré. Entonces, eh, lo otro es que ya ante eh, la, la sospecha de una infección, entonces también se usan esquemas de antibióticos que tampoco eh, cubren eh, muchas veces eh, el germen porque pues no se hace una identificación previa del, del patógeno, entonces se hacen tratamientos a ciegas. Todo esto eh, obviamente contribuye al uso eh, inadecuado o irracional de los antibióticos eh, con eh, los riesgos que esto conlleva, eh, resiste, especialmente la resistencia. Lo otro es que los marcadores que típicamente nos han mostrado como marcadores de infección o reactantes de fase aguda, eh, como la proteína C reactiva, la, el fibrinógeno, eh, la, la sedimentación, las transaminasas, la leucocitosis, eh, no, son, no, no, son, no se han estudiado eh, de manera clara o concreta como marcadores de infección y cuál es el, comporta el comportamiento que estos marcadores tienen en eh, cuando un paciente con una mordedura de serpiente eh, desarrolla esta infección. Sin embargo, pero como ya les dije, muchas veces se diagnostica infección sin una confirmación microbiológica eh, o solamente por la sospecha o eh, confundiendo el, la inflamación o la toxicidad local con la infección. Entonces no se conoce cuál es el verdadero comportamiento de estos marcadores eh, de o estos reactantes de fase aguda cuando se diagnostica eh, eh, o cuando se está frente a una infección en una mordedura de serpiente. El diagnóstico definitivo de la infección sería la confirmación microbiológica, pero también nos hemos enfrentado al hecho de que se encuentran patógenos, pero no necesariamente aislar un patógeno es eh, tener un diagnóstico concreto de infección. Eh, porque puede tratarse simplemente de una contaminación. Eh, también se toman cultivos luego de los antibióticos, ya porque se inició el antibiótico por la razón que sea, por la sospecha o por eh, un fin profiláctico, y luego el paciente desarrolla, yo he enfrentado esa situación muchas veces, eh, se, 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 el paciente viene a hospitales de alta complejidad como en el que yo estoy, y el paciente desarrolla la infección, y posteriormente hay que hacer un drenaje, eh, un debridamiento y eh, se toman cultivos en este momento, pero ya el paciente lleva varios días con antibióticos, entonces no logra eh, definir cuál es el germen y, si, y no se eh, tiene la certeza de que el antibiótico que se le está administrando está siendo efectivo. Tampoco hay un método estandarizado para la toma de la muestra eh, del cultivo en mordedura de serpiente. Muchas de estos, eh, los venenos de víboras, eh, tienen efectos sobre la coagulación y hay un gran temor en muchos médicos a tomar muestras eh, por eh, que se requiere eh, hacer, por ejemplo, una punción o tomar o una, una muestra mediante una biopsia. Y eh, como el paciente tiene una alteración de la coagulación, muchos médicos tienen temor a tomar la muestra por una punción o por una biopsia. Por lo tanto, hay una baja frecuencia de confirmación microbiológica en la mayoría de los estudios que muchas veces no supera en los estudios el 9% de los casos. Eh, como les decía, entonces se usan muchas veces eh, esquemas de antibioticoterapia eh, no dirigida eh, y esto eh, pues no siempre se acierta con el antibiótico que se está utilizando y eh, al no estar tratando adecuadamente la infección, entonces eh, el paciente se le complica su infección, esta empeora, hay que, entonces la infección empeora, el paciente debe ser llevado a procedimientos quirúrgicos de drenaje, de debridamientos, de amputaciones y esto aumenta los costos de la atención médica, incrementa la necesidad de eh, usar más insumos médicos, hacer más procedimientos, más los efectos secundarios de eh, estos antibióticos que muchas veces eh, pues, no se están prescribiendo racionalmente. De hecho, un estudio en Colombia encontró que en pacientes que tenían eh, diagnóstico presuntivo de infección, eh, se, usó, eh, se usaron antibióticos inadecuadamente en el 91% de los casos. Eh, los pacientes eh, como los que tenemos en nuestro medio con mordedura de serpiente por víboras, que como les mostré es el mayor número de casos, pues tienen otras, un alto riesgo de infectarse. ¿Por qué? Porque son pacientes que eh, por los efectos del veneno pues tienen anemia, tienen insuficiencia renal secundaria a los efectos del veneno. Eh, cerca de un 25% son personas mayores de, de 50 años que tienen comorbilidades que muchas veces no se les habían diagnosticado. 
además de eh, la manipulación, el deterioro de la perfusión tisular y el edema que, secundario que se presenta, eh, el tejido desvitalizado, como vemos en estas fotografías, todos estos son factores que incrementan el riesgo de la infección. Vemos acá, por ejemplo, en esta fotografía un paciente, esta foto de la izquierda se tomó al tercer día, ya se ven unas eh, necrosis eh, cutáneas incipientes y pues como vemos a los 21 días el paciente ya está eh, en proceso eh, de, eh, de lavado ¿sí? para eh, proceder posteriormente a un injerto cutáneo. Pero este paciente es un campesino que lleva tres semanas en el hospital y pues no ha estado trabajando y si bien el sistema de salud en Colombia cubre el suero antiofídico eh, y cubre estos tratamientos, pues para esta persona que vive en el campo y vive de un salario, eh, por, pues de, un, de, un, de lo que se gana diariamente por trabajar en el campo, es muy costoso para él y su familia eh, no estar generando eh, ingresos monetarios eh, por estar eh, con esta situación en el hospital. A veces los pacientes llegan con cambios locales muy sutiles, pero evolucionan a este tipo de lesiones, eh, que, eh, secundarias a la infección. Entonces, eh, la idea, eh, yo como les decía, estoy haciendo un doctorado y estoy en el trabajo de desarrollar un modelo de, de, de diagnóstico de infección que reúna elementos clínicos y de laboratorio eh, con el fin de eh, que a estos pacientes se les puedan eh, hacer diagnósticos clínicos de la manera más temprana posible, diagnósticos clínicos de infección, de manera que se pueda orientar eh, de, de la manera más eh, apropiada y más acertada o un tratamiento eh, con unos esquemas de antibióticos que eh, sean los más adecuados y que eh, reduzcan los tiempos de, de, de estancia hospitalaria eh, y que eh, también impacten en el uso racional de los antibióticos. Eh, entonces, no existen este tipo de, 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 de parámetros clínicos, por lo cual eh, eh, mi idea es desarrollar eh, esta, esta escala. Bueno, esto, esto era lo que tenía para mostrarles y eh, bueno, muchas gracias por sus preguntas y comentarios. Hi, thank you so much, Dana, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I realize it is 2.30 now, uh, GMT, so I believe the uh, interpreters have to hop off now, so feel free. Um, we do technically have a couple of other speakers scheduled. I'll just quickly check if they're online. Um, if Adisu or Patrick, if you are here, please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, I am Adisu from Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is found in the north, the western Africa, in the horn of uh, Africa. Uh, I am living in Gondar, Gondar, far from the capital city of Addis Ababa, 750 kilometers. It is 50, 50 minutes uh, flight. Uh, so Addis Ababa is uh, also the center of African Union. So uh, first of all, Uh, I wanted to thank you, Ansha and Luis, to give this uh, precious chance to present this uh, uh, snake bite uh, uh, articles uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, studied in uh, Gondar and Metama Hospital uh, and published in uh, the Journal of uh, Infectious. Uh, developing country uh, journal. Uh, so uh, you can please the next slide. The next slide, please. Okay, this article has uh, four uh, parts. Uh, I will focus on the main points and anyone to find this full research. I have a PowerPoint, uh, the link, so you can get uh, potentially life-threatening disease especially in uh, rural areas. So uh, the exact burden of snake bite in Ethiopia is unknown. The health problem is potentially underestimated because of reporting is not compulsory. Next slide. So this study assessed the clinical features and the risk factors associated with treatment outcomes of snake bite patients at me admitted to hospitals in the North Gondar uh, of Ethiopia. Gondar uh, University Specialized Hospital and uh, Matama uh, 
primary hospital. This is uh, uh, hospital is found in the uh, low altitude of uh, Ethiopia. This is the cash crop uh, production area. So these hospitals are admitted for so many daily laborers. Next slide, please. So uh, when I come to the methodology part, uh, this uh, study was done by then retrospective course study you using uh, routinely collected data from patient uh, medical records or charts from the two hospitals uh, uh, up to September 2012 uh, up to uh, 2020. Next slide. The different departments, uh, the mostly this uh, uh, research uh, done in medical uh, internal medicine department and some times in pediatric department. Next slide. So both hospitals are located near, near low attitude areas with, as mentioned before, with big season and cotton farms characterized with influx of about quarter million people of seasonal work in the harvesting and harming uh, uh, farming period. This is uh, because of the cash crop uh, cultivated area. This region is known as for having high burden of snake bites. It is uh, due to uh, unknown cases. So the study population uh, this uh, the September up to uh, uh, end August 2020. And both hospitals patients were managed with uh, polyvalent antivenom if their TNT minutes bedside clothing test is uh, prolonged. Next slide. Uh, data variables uh, have include social demographic information, age, gender, residence, occupation, and clinical symptoms. Uh, it is uh, place uh, and date of exposure to snake, clinical stages, time between bite and presentation at hospital, traditional uh, medication applied before arrival at the hospital, laboratory tests, complete blood count, liver and renal function tests, bedside clothing, are the variables, the social demography, clinical and uh, medical uh, laboratory are as uh, uh, variables of this uh, study. Next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, clinical severity was, uh, was assessed by uh, four stage, stages. Stage one, patient has uh, fang marks. That means dry bite due to uh, snake bite. Stage two with local findings only, pain, non-progressive swelling. Stage three with swelling that is clearly progressing systematic symptoms or signs and laboratory abnormalities. Stage four with uh, neurologic dysfunction and respiratory distress or cardiovascular instability or shocks are uh, the severity assessed uh, by uh, the above mentioned four stages. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this study was used uh, for analysis method Microsoft Excel structure data collection sheets for data entry and EP data uh, version and association audience Denmark and research findings are presenting using discrete statistics. Next slide, please. Next slide again. Next slide, please. This, when you come to the ethical approval, back the slides, ethical approval, okay. The ethical approvals obtained from the University of Gondar Institutional Review Board and the local administration of uh, Gondar uh, Health Bureau and also ethical approvals obtained as well from the Union of Ethics Advisory Group of the Center for Operational Researchers International Union against tuberculosis and lung disease, Paris, France. So the ethical approval obtained these uh, two institutions. Next slide. 
When it comes to the results, this result, the, uh, this article results, in this retrospective cohort study, 2050 snake bite patients treated uh, for both hospitals, their median age is T24, and uh, the season with highest number of snake bite cases was from September to uh, November. The field was the most frequent location of snake bite, uh, 77% and 82.2% of snake bites occurring during. So this is okay, next slide. Next slide and the next, the discussion uh, part. Next slide, please. Next. When I come to the discussion part in our study, we found that snake bite affects mostly male adults between the age group of uh, 15 up to 44 years old. And patients in our study are less than and eight years old, 57 percent, 57 uh, patients, or 22.9 percent are uh, eight years old. In, con in contrast, study with Nigeria, where only 30 pediatric cases were seen over a seven-year period, the majority of cases snake bite occurred in the field during the time on lower extremities. This is similar studies to done in other settings. Next slide. So commonly patients had uh, fever, swelling, sign of bacterial superinfection and bite site bleeding. More than half of the patients presented with clinical stage two that uh, I have mentioned before, uh, the stages implying local findings only such as pain, uh, in each mosis and non progressive swelling, unlike other studies, only a small percentage of patients applied tie or tourniquets relatively uh, compared to the other studies. Next slide. Use cultural medication in our study, maybe this may be due to the fact that patients who seek traditional medication uh, may stay in the community and are not attending hospitals. This uh, may be due to uh, the uh, farming uh, places far from the uh, and use uh, uh, herbal medication in next slide. So the limitation of this study, lack of continuous availability of reagents to determine coagulation tests in our setup may explain why only small portion of the patients had these tests. In our study, in addition to the normal record of coagulation laboratory tests, thrombin time, activated uh, partial thrombin time, and International normal ratio is the 20 minutes bedside clotting test. So uh, prolonged only uh, for uh, 70 patients or 90.5 uh, uh, percent. Next slide. So this retrospective court study on basis of patients recorded routinely collected in hospital setting. The relative weakness of uh, working with routine data is the missing of some information, such as laboratory tests, which could be due to absence of clinical indication, are observed for this uh, study. Next slide. And the other no availability tests are uh, one of the limitations. Next slide, please. So residents in uh, uh, Rural areas and advanced clinical stage were associated with uh, bad outcomes. This may be due to uh, the distance from the residents to the health facilities, which may delay time interventions and de uh, development of severe disease are uh, one of these limitations. Next slide. The antivenom uh, scarcity or an availability of antigenome is one of these the big uh, challenges of 
the outcome. Ne next slide. Availability of inadequate administration and affordability of the patients to buying the antivenom drug and uh, uh, unaffordable of a laboratory uh, uh, requested are uh, one of uh, the big challenge. Action to antivenom are known be uh, in 2008 similar to our study then in Brazil, no effect on mortality. So an availability of antivenom is uh, one of the result of bad outcomes in our setting. Next slide. So the burden of snake bite in Ethiopia, especially in uh, Gondor, in the low uh, attitude of uh, Northwest uh, Ethiopia, uh, can neighboring countries are is estimated to be high and the available data are possibly under reporting and underestimating the real burden. So uh, some data are not full, full uh, completely. So the interrupted supply of antivenom and affordability of the antivenom going to traditional healers, humanitarian crisis and study being hospital-based may contribute as factors for the underestimation of snake bite burden. These above mentioned uh, reasons are maybe uh, underestimate the, the snake bite burden in our setup. Uh, next slide. Our snake bite in this region of Ethiopia and the global level, but more importantly, on the management of snake bites, the recognition of factors associated with bad outcomes will guide the clinicians to identify patients who need to be treated with priority and also hospital administration to provide sufficient doses of antivenoms and other supportive medical and laboratory uh, commodities. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. When I come to the conclusion part, the case. Oh, hello, you cut out for a second there. We're all, all good. You can start from the conclusions again. Okay. There's a bad connection to here. No problem. You can start from here. Okay. When I this, the case fatality rate associated with snake bite is high. Timely presentation to the hospital at early clinical stage, appropriate clinical management, and availability of antivenomes are a cornerstone to reduce snake bite, morbidity, and mortality. Further, collaboration among the snake bite uh, snake stakeholders, community health and agriculture sectors, professional associations, and civil society must be established and strengthened to improve management of snake bite. Patients at different levels, uh, this uh, management and uh, preventive snake bites. These uh, stakeholders uh, doing uh, collaboratively is uh, our recommendation and conclusion part. Next slide. I think this is the last uh, my uh, slides. When I come to uh, my the this area in our setup. Uh, the thematic area of this topic, snake bite emergent diseases, is untouchable in our area. Outstanding the burden uh, be more than expected. Consequently, any institution, group, person want to further, further study this thematic area or provide or donate antivenom drug and reagents to our institution. Uh, University of Gondor Specialized Hospital and me voluntarily to facilitate in uh, addition to working uh, with you. So this is all about my presentation. This is the link to uh, find the full uh, articles. Thank you very much, uh, the hostess, and uh, prepare these uh, programs. Thank you. Um, so we'll just go ahead and wrap up.
So I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who has attended. Thank you so much to our interpreters for translating um, the presentations live. And thank you for, of course, all of the speakers uh, for presenting. Um, and just to remind everyone, um, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available on the Global Health Network's website in a few weeks. Um, so please look for, for it there. So thank you, everyone, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.